Greetings and welcome to the fourth event of our second annual Catholic Nonviolence Initiative Fall Series. I warmly welcome students and faculty, those who are live streaming through Facebook, and all who will be viewing the recording of tonight's event. My name is David Mueller, and I'm coming to you tonight from Casa Esther Catholic Worker in Agra, Wisconsin, located on the original homeland of the Ho-Chunk Nation, also known as the people of the sacred voice. This series promotes the mission and goals of the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative. The initiative, a project of Prox Christi International, seeks to raise awareness of and increase our understanding of nonviolence as a strategy, a way of life, and a key part of our faith. In this series, we have been exploring the crucial connection between violence and the climate crises, emphasizing the importance of nonviolent strategies in achieving sustainable ecological integrity. Today, tonight, we will listen to the stories of four young climate care activists. And after their discussion, we will open it up for your comments and questions. Please feel free to post any questions or comments in the chat at any time. Now I would like to take a moment to thank our sponsors. Because of all of our sponsors, we are able to provide this series to everyone at no cost. All right, here we go. So we, got, we have Network Advocates for Justice inspired by the Catholic Sisters. They do a great job of lobbying on many social justice issues um, in Washington, DC. We have the Catholic Climate Covenant. In fact, a couple of our panel members are very involved with the Catholic Climate Covenant. So you'll learn more about them at this time later. Casa Astor Catholic Worker House, from where I'm coming from, we have the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative of which this series promotes their mission. They are a project of Pax Christi International. We have EcoCare Now. Uh, one of the co-founders is uh, Eliane Lakeham, who's one of our organizers. And then of course we have Pax Christi USA. We have, a num we have an anonymous uh, family foundation that was very generous. And many of, the, many of the people that are watching through the live stream tonight have donated, uh, made donations to us. We also have a fun group out of Illinois, they, they made a very large donation and they call themselves the non-crabby women of faith. So we have quite a variety here. All right, you can take that down. I would also like to acknowledge my two colleagues who together we planned and organized this series over the past seven months. Eliane Lakeham. Eliane is a peace activist and consultant on gender responsive policies with a background in peace and security and environmental justice. She is a member of the Pax Christi USA Young Adult Caucus and one of the founders of EcoCare Now. And Michelle Sherman. Michelle is the project director for nonviolence and campus outreach for Pax Christi USA. She's on the leadership team for the Pax Christi Young Adult Caucus. And she is also an adjunct professor at the University of Dayton in Ohio. I also want to express my gratitude to John Avalon here at Casa Esther and Johnny Zakovich, who have done so much to, uh, for all the tech support these weeks. Now, before we move into today's panel discussion, let's take a moment for prayer. Here we go. Creator God, the beauty which enfolds creation is a mirror of your love and grace. We in turn are invited to be aware of the universal communion of which we are part of. Remind us that we are beloved and kin to one another. You gave us Christ as our light, through whom you created the world with the hand of your spirit. Help us to stay in relationships of joy, self-giving, and co-creation with all your creatures, and to bring about your heavenly city, fully realized on our planet, an everlasting realm of justice, peace, and joy. Fill us with the extravagant love and care you so generously shared with all creation, 
May we live our lives in gratitude for all your gifts. May we do our part to honor sacred creation. Amen. All right. And now I'd like to introduce and turn it over to our moderator for the evening, Ryan D. Corpel. Ryan is the managing editor of Outreach, a news and opinion site for L LGBTQ Catholics. His writing has appeared in the Washington Post, America, Boston College Magazine, The Emancipator, and elsewhere. So it's over to you, Ryan. Thank you so much and welcome. Thank you, David, for this opportunity. I'd like to welcome everybody on the live stream to tonight's session, and especially our four panelists who you will hear from in just a short minute. I'd like to provide a brief overview of the evening. As I said, tonight we will hear from four speakers, and each person will speak individually for 10 minutes, followed by some time for question and answers. And we'll wrap up this whole night in about one hour and 30 minutes. As people are speaking, you are welcome to type questions in the chat, and we will be monitoring the chat throughout the program. During the Q&A session, I will invite you to unmute and directly ask your questions to the speakers. If you do not feel comfortable unmuting, that is fine. I can read the questions to the speakers themselves. I'd like to remind each speaker that they have 10 minutes to share their presentations. And we will begin tonight with Teresa Rojo Sosi. Hi, everybody. Hope everyone's doing well. I am Teresa Rojo Sosi, which I live in Tuba City, Arizona, which is in the Gallup Diocese on the Navajo Reservation. And I am currently the DRE slash administrator, secretary, everything for my parish at the moment. And I've been there for almost 10 years, it will be 10 years next year. And how I fell into um, ecological work is, it, it's an interesting way of putting it because I believe as being Native American and Mexican and Catholic, um, growing up, you were always taught um, to take care of Mother Earth and Mother Earth would take care of you. And so I never really understood how the two met. Um, growing up, I always was asked how to be Native and Catholic. And I think as I was growing up, it wasn't as a struggle as it was until I was much older. And when I did become more involved in this work, it um, was more clear that I had been doing this work since I was little. And then when I started to become more involved with a uh, Tekka with the conference, um, I don't know if some of you may know uh, Saint Kateri. She took it with it. Not only is she the first Native American saint, but she is Native American and Catholic. And then she is also the eco ecological patron saint of ecology. So when I was doing this work or just stumbled upon this work, um, it was made more clear on how everything came together. And then now I just became a new mother and um, I had a baby girl last September. And so when you think about the future and I think about her future, it's kind of scary, you know, to think about everything that uh, she might face. And then I know when we've had conversations, when I've had conversations with other young adults, that is one of the main reasons why people do not have kids is because they're afraid of what the future may hold. And I do believe when we think about that, that's a, a big factor, you know, and then also too, you think about people who don't necessarily think this work or what's going on is real. I think that's one of the most challenging parts of this work. And then also too, I still live in an area where a lot of people still use, you know, coal as their main source of heating. Uh, they still burn trash or they still do little things like that that they don't necessarily think is harmful. Um, and also too, you have to think about where you live and more of, the economic st status, you know. Um, I remember when I was presenting at a conference and I was on a panel and I remember 
I got a little upset because I was first I was hungry and I got upset because everyone was using or was eating all the food. And then I remember telling them, you know, I have to drive an hour away to get basic necessities. Yes, I have a um, grocery store here, but the prices, they're very outrageous because it's, you know, they can set their own prices here on the reservation. And then also too, I have to drive an hour just for basic necessities. And also it's, it's you add on to your um, carbon, you know, your carbon intake. And I remember telling them that, that they take advantage, that they don't necessarily understand the privilege that they have to have everything um, within reach, within 10, 15 minutes. I don't have that luxury. Um, yes, we do do have um, Amazon and everything, but it takes like at least two days. And for me, when you think about little things like that, it does add up. Um, your trash intake, everything like that. And so when I got asked to be on a curriculum along with uh, Diana and a few other with Catholic Climate, I jumped at the chance because I wanted to voice my concern, you know, especially coming from where I come from and my and, and on the reservation uh, to let people know that it only does not only affect major cities, but it affects us as well. And so my call to this work has been stumbled upon, but I feel like what I have said and what I've contributed has been, I think, helpful, hopefully helpful. And sometimes when I think about this work, I think about now my daughter, you know, it'll be easier for easier for her, you know, to know what's going on. Um, hopefully, um, when she's older, that she understands um, everything that's going on. So, yeah, thank you guys for having me. Sorry, I have to be mindful of the time because I know she's waking up soon. So I'm like trying to like. <laughs> so okay. thank you Teresa we're going to move over now to Diana Merritt who also has 10 minutes thanks Ryan um, and thanks Teresa it's it's really great to be here tonight thank you for the invitation to share my story and also um, really special to be alongside this great group of panelists um, so I thought tonight since um, we're sharing stories about our work as uh, faith-based climate activists that I could talk to you all a little bit about my own faith journey and how I came to uh, work in climate uh, advocacy and also share with you some stats so and about this work and then I'll end with a little call to action but so uh, about me um I grew up in New York City um the child of immigrants um very Catholic I grew I was the type of kid that loved going to church loved going to CCD um, like memorized all the prayers and then would bully my little sister if she got them wrong. So like that was me as a kid. Um, my faith journey like took a different shape by the time I was 13 or 14. This was around the time of the Boston sex scandal and I sort of revisited what it meant for me to be Catholic. Uh, I found that I found it really hard actually to be Catholic. Um, and I felt a lot of tension in my life of how can I be part of a faith that has done harm? And um, I I'm imagine I'm imagine maybe that might resonate with other folks in this room. It just felt uh, really tense for me. And so I stepped away from the Catholic church um, and uh, just did like, for most of my like teens and twenties, just like didn't really consider myself Catholic anymore. Um, fast forward 
to the uh, my first job out of college. I was just sort of looking for a job. <laughs> I was uh, the first one that I found, um, which I thought was really interesting, was working with a Catholic elementary school, um, doing their admissions and marketing work. Um, and I did not think about it being Catholic. I just thought this there will be mentorship. This will be fun. I'm going to have a great experience. And I did, like for all of those reasons. It was a really um, powerful professional experience for me. But what I didn't expect is that it rekindled my faith life. I saw what was taking place in, in the school and I saw like an attention to the whole child and the whole family, uh, not just their faith and education, but also their like physical well being, emotional well being. Um, I saw the justice uh, foundation orientation of the church and I saw it lived out and that like surprised me and got me really intrigued so I got curious about this Catholicism thing I was like this is the faith that I grew up in and it's and it's doing something different uh that I hadn't seen before so I got really I got curious I started wanting to learn more um that eventually brought me into um sort of shaped my career and brought me to divinity school where I got to explore more about faith um, and, the, and the tensions of faith too. Um, I realized that some of the feelings that I was having when I was much younger are like, were, well, one, were not specific to me, but two, were also um, part of grappling with faith. And that, uh, that just sort of, has allowed me to live in the tension of a church that is still becoming and of a church that needs its people to actively shape it. Um, and that's so that's now where I come from in my faith life in in my work of uh, climate and advocacy and justice. So um, during the past few years, I was have been lucky to be in conversation with Catholic sisters um, and other climate and um, justice um, organizers, I've been in conversation with them around um, faith institutions and the role of uh, faith in moving forward climate work, specifically from a land-based lens, specifically from a decolonized lens, also um, looking towards racial and ecological healing. Um, the way that I consider the work of climate, uh, addressing the climate crisis is that it is um, an issue that uh, touches upon various justice issues. So it touches upon poverty, it touches upon um, racial injustice, it touches upon migration. I think climate really has this overview of various justice issues. Um, and in that lens, I think our Catholic tradition gives us a framework to address the multiplicity uh, that is part of um, or that comprises of the climate crisis. Pope Francis speaks of the work of integral ecology, of um, that uh, our systems are interrelated and in fact that we too are interrelated. And I think coming from that lens then allows the work of uh, climate justice to be done from um, knowing, knowing our, um, our relationship to one another, but then also knowing that these issues are compounded um, and affect various other issues. So with that, I'm going to um, talk some statistics to you all. So I'll share my screen. I want to share with you all basically like three major points around uh, Gen Z uh, and climate, um, Gen Z and the church, and then also the church and climate. So some some thoughts. So we have here 
Uh, this was a, a really comprehensive study that was issued about two years ago in 2021 that looked at 10,000 young people across the globe. I believe it was eight or nine countries, including the United States. And these are young people ages 16 to 25. Um, and it was about their uh, thoughts and feelings on climate change and, and governmental response. What did it find? 59% are very or extremely worried about climate. 84% are at least moderately worried. Um, over 50% felt sad, anxious, angry, powerless, helpless, and guilty. Um, and 45%, over 45% said their feelings about climate change negatively affected their daily life and functioning. That's significant. These are, this is, these are really significant numbers. Um, climate change and the climate crisis is on our minds, and especially on the minds of Gen Z. I'll note too, um, just this last point that respondents rated the governmental response to climate change negatively and reported greater feelings of betrayal than reassurance. And I think there's, I'll touch upon this later, but I think there's room then for advocacy to our legislative officials around this. So highlight, Gen Z is thinking about and is anxious about climate change. So now, this, these are some interesting findings um, issued by the Springtide Research Center. Uh, it's the US-based research center that studied um, 13 to 25 year olds uh, in 2022 and found that 55% reported that they had a, a experienced a, a sacred moment at some point in their life. Um, another note, 68% identified as religious and 77% as spiritual. So Gen Z in the US, significant spiritual and religious um, identification. And then I lost that. So what is the church saying about climate change now? I'll look at specifically at the US church. Uh, there's a 2022 Pew Research study that found that uh, 40 percent of Catholics who went to services so there's often no discussion of climate change. I mean this sort of tracks right when we go to church we don't often hear it very explicitly stated um, but some colleagues of, of mine uh, at the Covenant, a Creighton University professor, um, decided to look more deeply into this and did a, a study of 12,000 columns written by bishops um, in the years around the publication of Laudato Si, which was uh, Pope Francis's sort of landmark encyclical about care for creation. And this study found that less than 1% of columns mentioned or discussed climate change. Um, so takeaways here, uh, the synthesis. Gen Z's concern about climate um, is significant. There's a, it's a major area of concern. Also, at the same time, Gen Z is experiencing um, strong identification to, towards religion and spirituality is, is uh, delving into that. And what's the church saying about this? Not enough. Not enough in the U.S. church. So my call to action would be that bringing our faith into this work of climate is needed. Um, it broadens the conversation. It's a really powerful extension to climate advocacy. And furthermore, the US church needs it. We need um, young adults and youth to uh, further the conversation within the US church. So I'll end uh, with Pope Francis. This is from his um, uh, writing uh, Fratelli Tutti. He says to young people, dear young people, my joyful hope is to see you keep running the race before you, outstripping all those who are slow or fearful. Keep running, attracted by the face of Christ, whom we love so much, whom we adore in the Holy Eucharist, and acknowledge in the flesh of our suffering brothers and sisters. May the Holy Spirit urge you on as you run this race.
The church needs your momentum, your intuitions, your faith. We need them. And when you arrive where we have not yet reached, have the patience to wait for us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. We're going to move now to Nia White, who will also have 10 minutes. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Nia White, so I will share my screen very quickly. Um, I like to use a PowerPoint. Um, I just self-identify as a toddler, so I need to keep on track, so I do apologize ahead of time. So um, just a few things about me. I am now a coordinator of peer ministry and service at Lewis University, which is run by uh, the Christian Brothers. So it's exciting to hear about Spring Tide. You know, we talk about it all the time at our university. Um, I love hiking. I love camping. Um, I love rocks, as you can see, and I have dogs and I have a family who I love dearly. Um, so um, a few years ago, I um, was a part of a convent of a Carmelite order in the Philippines, in Bacolod City. And one day um, I had this excruciating pain in 2020. Um, so going to the hospital during that big event that happened in 2020 um, was very scary, um, but um, I had to go and I found that I had gallstones. And if you know anything about Bacolod City, um, it's heavy with pollution. There's jeepneys, cars, trucks. Um, and, you know, I was, it was the first time since I had um, arrived there in 2019 that I experienced no pollution, um, not coughing when I go outside, not needing to cover my face because there were no cars on the road. And then a few months later, um, for All Souls Day, um, we went to the um, the sisters' um, cemetery site. They have a plot just for the sisters. And um, the sister's walking me around. She's like, oh, that sister died of asthma. That sister died of uh, uterine cancer. And, and I asked her, I'm like, oh, is, you know, what's that about? She's like, oh, no, it's just a way of life. And so I'm sitting here thinking, like, this, this is not um, coincidence. This, is, this is, has to be environmental. And um, I keep, I was getting sick. Um, I, was, I was generally healthy before I moved there, but I just kept getting sick and more sick. Um, and then I left the convent and I got a job at Jordan River Farm um, in Pembroke Township. Pembroke Township is about two hours south of Chicago. It's a, a primarily Black community, historically a farming community, um, and I loved it. I was director. Um, I was able to wear hats all the time. We were at a farm. I was at a compost. I was doing everything I just really, really loved to do. And um, in meeting the community, they embraced me right away. And in embracing me, they were explaining about what's really going on in the community. So um, the community primarily runs on, a nat they don't have natural gas. So most families have wood burning, you know, to warm their homes. Um, and a lot choose that way of life because they don't want to poison the land. And um, there's a a big gas company that, come, that uh, got a big grant. And um, is doing everything they can to um, be against um, not having the, um, their presence there. So it's a big fight that's still going on to this day. Um, and I didn't, it's not my home community, so I didn't want to um, just not be a part of it, be a part of the fight. Um, but I'll go back to just little things that I, you know, my background um, my grandparents were in a farm when I grew up. I did a lot of coursework living in the convent and on the orphanage. There was a lot of um, farming that we were able to do and I was just loosely in involved. So I was never really heavily interested until I got into the fight in Pembroke Township and seeing um, the high rate of you know the health sickness. Uh, we didn't have a um, grocery store for about 30 miles, um, a hospital. So if you were to have a heart attack, um, you wouldn't um, more likely not survive. So it was very, very scary. We didn't have internet. And uh, something that we just think as a privilege is really a, for um, the community is a right. Um, we have people with diabetes who need um, pumps that require Wi-Fi, but there was no reliable broadband. So that was a fight. So it's always just a fight um, at the program. 
So I should say a little more about Jordan River Farm, a uh, sustainable farm and uh, retreat center through the Diocese of Joliet. Um, we bring down families and uh, communities and schools down to Pembroke Township to help and serve our brothers and sisters in the um, Diocese of Joliet uh, down in Pembroke to either build homes, uh, to grow food, as you see in our boxes, uh, boxes there. And um, there's a few challenges. Um, so there's a lot of pressures from uh, the Diocese of Joliet. Um, they have recently restructured and um, the community didn't feel that Jordan River Farm was in line with the community mission. Um, they felt that we needed to be fighting more about, natural, about the natural gas fight and environmental issues. And we were, we wanted to do more something else. So I was in between there, wanted to appease the board, but I also wanted to be appropriate to the community. Um, and then I experienced a lot of uh, burnout and I went in with more questions and I had to really have as many answers. Um, I ended up getting more sick because I was, I was not taking care of myself and I still had the environmental issues that I had from uh, the Philippines. So I'm still getting more and more sick. My dad passed and I had a lot, I just lost complete focus um, of what I was supposed to do. But I, I have to say the form is no longer. Um, so when they asked me to be on the uh, panel, I was like, oh man, it's no longer, but um, and that's okay. Um, I still, I still compost. I still do, you know, as much as I can um, to be, you know, nice to this earth that we were given, the earth that I share with there, all of you. Um, and I do hope one day to get back into agriculture, get back into um, being a part of the world. Because as I would like to bring children to where I want to, at least bring them to a world that I'm helping to um, to grow. So there's different ways just, uh, that you can be a part of your community. Um, I would say if you're in high school, get involved, um, talk to your teachers, your faculty and staff to start new organizations. Um, I work with Lewis University and we are an Arboretum. Um, so I always tell our students to get, get to know our facilities and grounds. They uh, make our um, campus very beautiful and they do it in a very green and sustainable way. So it's a great place to learn. Uh, it's like getting another degree for free. Um, I would say start small, dream big, um, I think when we started uh, Jordan River Farm, we were very excited. We dreamed big and didn't realize all of the different factors that came into running something so big. Um, and then I would say be patient. Uh, please be kind to yourself with any, any mission, any work that you do. You have to take care of yourself so that you have a full cup to fill others with. And everything that you have, may, every dream that you have might not happen right away. Um, and that's okay. Just be patient and be kind to yourself in those moments. Um, but yeah, so I, um, very sad that the farm is no longer, but that's okay. Um, you know, I know that someday I can be a part of something else. I hope maybe I'll be a part of Park Street one day, but, um, I'm very, very, you know, just glad that I had the experience and that I can continue to share in, in different ways. So thank you. And, um, Thanks for having me. Thank you, Nia. Yeah. And we'll move now to our final panelist, Henry Glenn, who also has 10 minutes. Thanks, Ryan. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Henry Glenn, and I'm I feel so honored to get to speak after all of these wonderful presentations. So thank you to everyone else for sharing the way that you did. Um, and thanks for those of us taking the time to be together tonight. Pax Christi and the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative are, um, hold a special place in my heart. Um, and as I speak tonight for the next 10 minutes or so, I'll make sure that I'm on time. Um, I, I've kind of been thinking of myself during this hour about like, oh, how am I going to introduce myself? Um, as, and I think it's just as a receiver of many, many gifts during the last, during especially the last few years. So I'm happy um, to share a little bit of my story and to, and to just offer myself as a resource for any of you um, looking to kind of step into this really, really important um, and really holy space. So these are lots of pictures. Um, so at, at just as I talk, just kind of feel free to look around. I'll probably bounce around and point to some of them, but 
Um, my name is Henry and I'm from a very small town in the northeast corner of the state of Kansas. My mom was a family practice physician and my dad um, was a stay-at-home dad and then became after going to school at night and during the day and kind of being full-time dad for my younger sister, Ellen and I, he became my high school English teacher and then the high school principal at the small public high school in my small town in Kansas. Um, I was lucky to attend in the top right um, at Creighton University, which is a Jesuit school in Omaha, Nebraska, a couple hours away from my hometown. Um, I made many, many friends there and, and really enjoyed my time. I studied political science and theology um, between, between August of 2019 and May of 2023, this last May, which feels like a lifetime ago, but also five minutes ago. So I, I'm a recent college graduate, uh, but I've been really lucky to, to, to have experienced, especially kind of since the onset of the pandemic in 2020, some just some once in a lifetime opportunities that um, that have changed my life. The framing questions for tonight are how has your faith shaped your choices? And then how is this gospel call to nonviolence kind of living itself out in, in my work and in my life? Um, and I feel so lucky that those are, that those have been since I stumbled upon an organization called Catholic Climate Covenant in the fall of 2021, those, those things have been tied together for me, um, by lots of grace and lots of really, really great people. Um, so, when I was a junior political science student, I knew that I was going to be moving to Washington, D.C. for a spring semester there. Creighton owned a house, and I was I was allowed to find any job that I wanted. So I looked around on Capitol Hill, and I had an interest in law, so I was applying to things at the Department of Justice, and I had just come off of a really formative summer experience abroad where I taught um, at a preschool and lived with a host family and worked on a five-acre organic farm in um, in the hill country of Tanzania in East Africa. And that was a summer of like lots of silence and lots of hard work. And I, I felt like I got to, I, God and I got to know each other a lot better that year. And I kind of decided that this, that, that service to others was going to be what my life was about. Um, and I tell, I tell this story from Tanzania often, but I had always been an outdoorsy person as a, as a boy scout. I grew up around farm country. Um, we love traveling to Colorado. This picture in the middle is, is a sunset picture from, um, from a, from a spot that I've spent lots of time in Southern Colorado and the Spanish peaks kind of Sangre de Cristo area. Um, but I think the, the, like the facts and the effects of climate change became real one Sunday morning in Tanzania. I think I was about halfway through my trip when I woke up, um, and there was frost on the ground. And I thought that's kind of weird. It hasn't, it's not the rainy season. It hasn't frosted yet this time, um, but I didn't think much of it. And I walked the 45 minute walk to mass and went to the four hour long full of singing and dancing mass in Swahili and didn't understand a word of it and came back to the house like I did every week. Um, but my host family was not in their usual Sunday mood or positions. They were sitting around kind of hands in heads in their hands, sort of um, sort of crying and all of the tomatoes that we had planted, that they had spent like about a hundred US dollars on and, and spent lots of time cultivating and bought land for. And it was to, of course, like feed the school children for lunch every day. Um, those tomatoes had frozen overnight in this freak frost. Um, and there was no talk, there was no insurance plan. There was no talk of like more tomatoes. They were just gone. And I think at that moment, and then and then since then, many, many other things and other times, but that was when I was like, wow, this is, this is real. This climate change is, not only is it real, I knew it was real, but, um, but has real effects on, on the billions of people in this world who live day to day and, 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 and rely on the earth. So I think as I, I may have lost everybody for a second. Okay, looks like somebody, some, we're back now. Sorry if my internet cut out. Um, getting to the part of the story that's going to tell you why my internet is cutting out. But I moved to Washington, D.C. and and then and, and was lucky enough to work for Catholic Climate Covenant for about six months um, on Capitol Hill. And from my computer and from all over the place, and, and, and I just learned so much about, about Catholic advocacy and about the climate. Um, and the, the picture in the bottom right is from February 24th, 2022, um, a day that many people will remember for the day that, um, that Russia invaded Ukraine. 
but also um, was a day that Pope Francis joined a Zoom call with a bunch of college students from the Americas, from uh, North, Central, and South America and the Caribbean islands. So I was blessed to have an opportunity to share with him the results of that survey from the Creighton University professor, Dr. Dan DeLeo, and um, fellow co-workers at the, at, at the Climate Covenant, um, Emily Burke. And we shared with the Pope that the U.S. bishops maybe aren't living out the fullness of the church's climate teaching and what does that mean and and where do young people fit in and he had and he, he had really positive responses for us um, encouraged us to continue in this work so like any good catholic i'll do what the pope tells me to do and i was lucky enough to spend then the next 18 months and currently still um share some time with catholic climate covenant helping people and bishops and um, other young folks across the country kind of strategize around this goal of it's time for us to grow together in this really concrete way, especially in the United States, in the developed world. Um, and it's the living out of our faith that that impels us to do that. So my faith certainly shaped the choice to go to Africa, which then shaped the choice to move to DC and work for Catholic Climate Covenant. Um, it shaped my senior year at Creighton when I was kind of able to take on a leadership role um, within the student sustainability group. And then um, has absolutely shaped my current occupation and move, which is that I am a member of the 30th cohort of the University of Notre Dame's Alliance for Catholic Education Teaching Fellows Program. It's a two-year commitment to serve in Catholic schools in various dioceses across the country um, as full-time teachers and full-time graduate students. So the picture here is from the summer at Notre Dame with the four other people that I that I live and serve in the Diocese of Brownsville, Texas with. So I live um, in the upper Rio Grande Valley, and I teach in Brownsville, Texas at a school um, called St. Joseph Academy that is um, about one and a half miles from the United States southern border. So I'm exposed to a whole new range of climate impacts and um, all kinds of different people there. I teach uh, ninth grade world geography and 12th grade United States government and economics and and that, and that is another example of how this gospel called a nonviolence is, is, able, is able to be lived out in my life and in my work. Um, everything that we do in, in our classroom is framed through the principles of Catholic social teaching and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And there's no if, ands, or buts about it. Caring for creation is the core of, of the Catholic young person's faith right now in certainly at St. Joseph Academy, but I think all across the country, we're experiencing this move toward greater nonviolence in general. We're following that example from Pope Francis and from other transformative leaders and other young people and other, we, we, we just can feel it happening. It's a movement of the spirit if there ever was one. So that is my story. Um, and I just continue to be so blessed by opportunities to, to share spaces like this one, but also um, to put to kind of put the boots on the ground and do some work. And it's been so inspiring hearing from um, hearing from these others tonight and from the many, many others on the call and those who serve and Fox Christie and Casa Esther and everyone who is working to make this happen. Um, it's a group effort. It's a ground up effort. Um, and I'm and I'm happy to be a part of it. So please know I can put some links in the in the chat. But um, if you are a young person on this call or you're watching a recording and you're interested in getting involved, Catholic Climate Covenant has um, not only a wonderful youth and young adult mobilization program, but also um, a, an advocacy network across the country. It's called the Encounter for Our Common Home campaign. Um, it was started in response to, um, to Congress's seeming inability to pass climate funding, and then they passed the Inflation Reduction Act, and we were we continue to meet with Catholics um, in, in legislative offices and in dioceses and archdioceses around the country um, and help to mobilize people, especially from the important perspective that um, generation generate that, that the millennial the millennial generation and generation Z have to offer. So uh, not that others are excluded. We work together in intergenerational solidarity, but but just know that that, um, that, that is available and that you're welcome in, in that space any way that you come. So I'll stop sharing and hand it back over to Ryan and, and our wonderful facilitators, but thank you very much. Thanks to Henry, to all of the panelists for sharing their reflections on how they got involved in climate work and also on gospel nonviolence. We're going to move now into a conversation section of the evening before um, taking it over to Q&As from the audience. I'd like to ask for the panelists, if they can, to engage in a conversation with each other about what they found interesting about each other's 
speeches and whether or not there were any commonalities or differences that they heard from fellow climate activists. And I would also add maybe as a jumping off question, if people can elaborate on how they integrate gospel nonviolence into their work as climate activists and also how they first became familiar with the idea of, of Catholic nonviolence. I can start us off. Um, it, one, it's really sweet to see your daughter get us on screen. Um, I, I um, am grateful for how um, folks here just shared the, the personal perspectives, right? So Teresa, how having your baby has sort of shifted how you think about climate and the work that you do and mm -hmm. yeah, how being uh, in the Philippines and seeing environmental health impacts there and experiencing them um, has also shaped your understandings. Um, and Henry too, just, uh, you know, your story um, in Tanzania and witnessing that family's loss um, at because of the frost, like uh, it's uh, your tangible stories. Um, I think are really powerful, and I those are things that I'll take home with me tonight. I think with all of each of us and how it's. Um, I think when I was doing this work or just sharing my own story, you know, I realized that everyone has that one, one faith journey um, story that we can each all share that not only brought us closer to our faith, but I think just closer to the work that we generally do. Um, and I think for some, it's, you know, um, they always question like how or what or where can they go? And I think when you look to other people's stories, it's also encouraging. And so I think hearing each of your stories, it, I think hopefully encourages others, you know, in the work that they do. And it's cool to see um, that it's not a job. It's not just something you're just doing. It's a way of life. It's something that um, you're going to give on to your children, you're give on to your friends. Um, and hopefully you can be a part of the work that you do. Um, I'm always in awe of that because I, I want to become more like that. I want to um, put my whole heart in, you know, as best, the best way that I can. So, um, and just be proud of whatever outcome. And so I can only imagine, you know, the pride and that you have in your work. And um, you just tonight I was able to see that. It's, it's interesting that you mentioned that, uh, that you know, because the word that's sticking out to me is perseverance is that in all three of your stories i heard i heard themes of perseverance um today so just like with the, just even where you where you live and how you work is person is is a journey of perseverance and um and diana your journey kind of with the faith and with other people and to like to now be doing this transformative work um is just incredible and that you we're open to the change. I think that's part of the gospel call of nonviolence is being is being open to the change of heart. That my Catholic faith is not only going to be something much more than one hour on Sunday morning, but actually that it's going to change. It's going to change the way that I vote and the way that I think and the way that I interact with people, um, and and the way that I really the way that I see the world. Um, so uh, the story, the story of the farm and Juliet, um, like hurts my heart, right? But but to know that that's not the end and that there is, yeah, that you can never, if you live kind of a gospel call to nonviolence and even in times like this, in the past two weeks, when we've been reading news stories that are anything but nonviolent, um, you don't, you can't lose. You can only like learn and move on and be strengthened by it, um, which I think is encouraging, but yeah, thank you all so much for sharing. Bouncing off what, Henry had just mentioned, uh, Nia, you mentioned experiencing some illness and burnout from your work. I'm wondering how climate activists can both continue what is oftentimes very difficult work while also taking care of themselves. And that's a question for everybody. Man, I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, I would say um, what I would do, uh, I kept my Sunday for my faith, the best as, as much as I could. I kept that for my faith. 
which, you know, taking care of myself, whatever that way may be. Maybe that was um, going for a walk, um, resting, staring at a wall for an hour, whatever, to just rest, like just the physical taking care. Um, and like in, in like my family's community will say like, you know, stay woke, you know, always kind of seeing what's wrong. But when you're like wide awake all the time, you become delirious. So you just have to just kind of step back and just like and breathe um, and just be kind to yourself. I think that's something that I had to, I had to learn the hard way is just be kind to yourself, be patient. Like, you know, your big dream is not always going to happen. We want it to, you know, hopefully it will, but give yourself some grace that it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, and, and that it's not about you. And, um, like, and that's something I learned from the community that I worked with. They said, it's not about you, you know, we'll be fine without you. And that really, really changed how um, that I do mission. Um, it's it's not about me. It's it's about all of us together. And I'd be curious to see what else other people say, oh, the three of you say about how you um, experience in your work. Yeah, I'll continue up there about the word that came to mind for me was community. Like whenever I, um, I know this about myself, whenever I'm in a bad place, I self-isolate. Um, mm. My instinct is just to sort of like be in my own stuff. Um, and I don't let people know that I'm having a hard time or I don't like welcome people in. And so for me, I know that I need to reach out to community. Um, I need to be held in community. Um, I need to welcome people in and like let them shift and shape me. Um, and uh, I sort of need to trust that like my individual work is part of a bigger whole. So like, even though this like maybe one thing doesn't work out um, or like maybe I'm pushing for one thing, you know, I'm doing climate advocacy in this like very specific niche center right within the U.S. church um, that it's it's all contributing to a greater whole. Um, and so like when I balance that, I'm like, I know that this work is in something bigger. I'm in something bigger. I can be you know, I can I can and I should welcome the influence of my friends, of my family, of my church community. Um, of the climate community um, and know that we're in it together. But I see you want to go. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just going to say I agree with Diana with community. I think when we were doing the curriculum for homemakers with Catholic climate, um, I think for me, it was making sure to let people know when I needed help and it was OK to ask for help. And it was okay also to say no on certain things. You know, it's okay to say no. That way you don't burn yourself out. Um, it's just so funny that you mentioned burnout because um, at church, you know, I come from a small parish and right now we're experiencing um, less parishioners. And because of that, we have to take a little break from Savings to Paul. Our Savings to Paul Society has to take a little break and you know, when asking for new members, it was mentioned, you know, we don't want to keep asking the same people because we don't want them to burn out. And, you know, you never realize when doing this work, you do burn out and it's okay to ask for help. And it is okay to say no. Uh, I think that's the one thing that I'm learning is to still say no and not feel guilty, you know, especially being a new mom. Like I can't, I'm supposed to be on maternity leave and then you know, still getting asked to do certain things, I have to be like, no, I can't do that, you know, right now. So I think with the, for me, experiencing burnout, it's okay to ask for help and extend your community and just learn to say no, I think, and not feel guilty. <laughs> yeah, I'd echo what everybody said. I think the word for me is integration. Um, it was really hard to leave the full-time or pseudo full-time or whatever sort of work I was doing with Catholic Climate Covenant. Like it was my thing for like a year and a half. Um, and I had to leave that. And now I have 14 and 17 year olds in my classroom all day. And I don't, and I don't get to have these high level, cool conversations about climate change and what should the church do? And like, it, you know, um, 
I, but it doesn't make the work less important. I think, I think there's been a narrative promoted by, um, not, not necessarily intentionally, but, I, but there is so much alarm. I mean, Diana showed the stats, even among Catholics, like the, the alarm is so high about the climate crisis that I think sometimes folks who do climate adjacent work, maybe like Ryan writing about it or something like you don't need to feel bad if you're not in it full time, if it's not your only thing, because, and this is the gift of Catholic social teaching, it does tie into everything. It, it is a principle. Care for God's creation is a principle of Catholic social teaching and therefore is part of this gospel call to nonviolence and therefore is integrated into every sort of job. Teresa shows care for creation by not throwing away every piece of paper that comes across her desk. Like, or, you know, like I share, I show my care for creation, not only through like the class material and the other things, but like also when I have a group of senior boys eating lunch in my room, I recycle my, whatever. We make a conscious effort, like to not waste food or to, you know, it's, it's all about just, it's about living this way. Um, and, and I think knowing that you can integrate climate and creation care into whatever work it is that you do, um, that contributes to this, this sum is greater. It, it, the whole is then greater than the sum of all of its parts if we're all working together with that in mind. I've received a question here from Rachel. Rachel, would you like to unmute and ask your question directly or would you like me to ask it? She said that I can ask. All right, thank you. The question for any of the panelists is, does their gender identity and or sexuality shape the role they have as a climate advocate? Or how do they see gender as playing a role in this topic, especially with young people? I can answer. Um... I would say for me, um, it shapes maybe the what type of things I feel comfortable fighting for or um, being a part of. Um, like there's certain chemicals or certain foods like for women's health that will affect us a little differently than men. Um, there's a book uh, called Intersectional Environmentalism, uh, in, in, Intersectional Environmentalist. I would recommend it. It's by Leah Thomas. And it talks about like the different things. Like it's not just one part of you that's fighting, it's different parts of you. So I've been really exploring that um, as a Black woman, as a woman, um, what that means. Um, so I'm still kind of figuring that out. So I don't have like a a solid answer, but I'm still like figuring out like what that means and how I interact in the world. If that helps. Yeah, I, I appreciate this question. Um, um, I think, yeah, coming personally, I think about the multiplicity of identities that I carry and how that impacts my lens in the world and how I can share that um, in the advocacy work that I do in my writing in um, and along those lines, I think of what other voices can I bring in? Um, so like for example, um, with the homemakers curriculum, um, you know, that group was really intentional about uplifting frontline community members and the impact of climate, um, the climate crisis and environmental um, injustice on those communities. So that uh, that was part of, you know, the curriculum that way folks um, who are learning this 101 on climate science and this 101 on integral ecology that is part of this curriculum, that their voices of frontline community members are, are integrated. Um, similarly, with some of the uh, advocacy organizing that I do with Catholic Climate Covenant, um, I'm really aware and mindful of the uh, diversity within the room of organizers. So, um, you know, do we have racial diversity? Um, is there class diversity? Um, 
gender diversity, et cetera, like making sure that um, as we do this work, that I am orient, uh, have an orientation towards intersectionality and uplifting um, various voices, um, especially those most impacted. Um, so yeah, I, I appreciate this question because I, um, it's one that I'm hearing from young adults um, in this space of how do we bring in our identities here? How are you bringing in your identity here? Um, and the thing is like our identities are um, our strengths, like it's where it provides perspectives for us and it requires awareness, right? So like, what is our perspective and where might we have shortfalls to because we're not aware of other folks's um, life experiences. And so how can we like broaden the conversation? So yeah, just appreciate the question. speaking with Michelle Sherman a couple of days ago, and we were talking about how oftentimes we hear the question, how can we get young people involved in climate work? But the reality is that many of them are already involved, and tonight is an example of that. So instead, I'd ask, how can we spotlight the essential climate activism already being performed by young people, especially those in marginalized groups? Well, Ryan, I think that the last part of your reframed and more pointed and very eloquent question is is the key, is, is frontline communities and marginalized groups. And those are the voices that should be spotlighted um, for a hundred reasons that all make sense to everyone here, um, but, but mostly for the fact that that is the church. That that is the, the church is, yeah, the church is young people and the church is frontline and marginalized communities. Um, if Jesus isn't there, I don't know where he is. I, I, and I think that I think that highlighting highlighting and 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 emphasizing those voices is should be a priority for should be a priority for all the organizations already doing this sort of work. Pox Christi, Catholic Worker Houses, Catholic Climate Covenant, uh, universities, other folks that have access and and already amplify young people's voices should amplify those young people's voices, for sure, um, with the overall goal of then amplifying those voices into spaces where they don't normally fit in the Catholic world and in the political world. Uh, it, it's just the fact of the matter that a bishop might not know about the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative. But with enough noise, like young, we can make enough noise that then a bishop in a, in a is invited into a space like this and then can know that this is the church and that this is the future. And it's not then two separate echo chambers of, well, look at all these young people doing all this amazing work and why isn't the church doing anything? And the church saying, all we're hearing about are these other issues. We don't, we're not hearing about creation care. Like there has to be a dialogue that occurs in a strategic, but more importantly, a nonviolent and peaceful way um, between all of the groups at play so that these voices of young people can be highlighted. So those are my, those are my two cents, but I'd love to hear what other people have to say. Yeah, I, um, yeah, I appreciate the question because the reality is that young adults are doing this work. Um, and so it's not like, how do we get them involved? It's, it's that like, uh, how, do, how do we, I think the question for the church is how do we do this work intergenerationally? Um, how do we bring bridge together intergenerational gaps um, when that could be really challenging? Um, I think, you know, uplifting young adult voices with panels like these, uh, with webinars, with opportunities also for young adults to get to meet one another. Um, because there are so many people doing this work, but, you know, maybe in various universities across the country or in different uh, parish groups, um, and they might not know each other. So, like, creating spaces for um, folks to, to get to know one another and network. Um, and then, yeah, and, you know, I'll just go back to my last point. I really think 
we as a church have an opportunity to be an intergenerational um, solidarity with one another where we can learn from and alongside one another. Um, and I, I, I think that's, that will help bring us forward. Um, uh, the like, uh, the established um, nature of um, older generations who maybe have more financial resources or who have um, uh, connections or networks in place alongside uh, younger adults who have, um, you know, the energy, um, they have the curiosity to be asking really hard questions and to like further the conversation in I think really compelling ways. Um, I think there's an opportunity there to co continue bridging those relationships. Um, and then lastly, I'll say like, if you're doing this work and you want to, to uh, um, sort of share and, and, and let us know about the work you're doing, like, please contact me, please reach out to Catholic Climate Covenant. We wanna know what you're doing. We wanna highlight your work uh, in various ways, connect you with other people too. So please um, let me know what you're doing. I'd love to connect. I'd like to open the floor now to give our audience members an opportunity to speak directly to our panelists here and ask any questions that they may have. So we can we can open that up now if you'd like to unmute yourself um, and ask any questions directly. Good question. Yes, Nia. Okay, uh, I just had a question for um, everyone, uh, our panelists. Um, how can I or anyone here support you in the work that you do? How can we, like, what what can we do? What would you need? Um, you know, how could we a part be a part of what you all are doing? All right, I'll 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 go first. Um, I think we also have some slides on this later, but um, there's a few various like ways you can be involved. Um, so we have with Catholic Climate Covenant the Integral Ecology Resource, um, which has been mentioned and which Teresa was a key part of creating, Whole Makers. Um, I think somewhere in the chat, there's a link to it. So look at Whole Makers. Um, see if, you, if that's something that you can implement within your own community. Um, along those lines too, we are having with Catholic Climate Covenant, a webinar tomorrow about the various programs that we offer with youth and young adults, including homemakers and, um, and an advocacy program that we, uh, organizing program that we launched called Common Home Corps. Um, I'll put the registration link in the chat too. So feel free, uh, it'll be recorded. So if you're not able to make it, you can also just, um, if I watch the link later. Thanks for putting that up on the screen too. This is Homemakers. Um, we're going to be at the Ignatian Family Teach-In for Justice this weekend. So you can support by coming to say hi to us there. I know Pax Christie will also be there as well. Um, and I'm, I'm sure there'll be a little bit more information about that later. Um, you know, there are advocacy asks that Catholic Climate Covenant um, promotes. That's the work that Henry had been doing um, last year. We currently have a an advocacy ask to include forgiveness and debt restructuring on the agenda for COP28. Um, this is a really simple ask that you can make to President Biden or former, um, shoot, I'm getting our folks, um, as a second envoy, uh, Carrie. Yeah, um, climate envoy, John, John Carrie. Carrie, thank you for that. Um, so that, that link is on there. Um, there's a, yeah. And then if you just want to learn more, just go onto our youth and young adult mobilization page and you can sign up and we'll give you more information.
Earlier this month, Pope Francis released his apostolic exhortation on the environment, Laudate Deum. This is a type of sequel document to his 2015 encyclical Laudato Si on care for our common home. The Pope wrote, quote, if we consider that emissions per individual in the United States are about two times greater than those of individuals living in China, and about seven times greater than the average of the poorest countries, we can state that a broad change in the irresponsible lifestyle connected with the Western model would have a significant long-term impact. I'm wondering how that strikes people of the group. What, what is the responsibility of Western countries specifically to address this crisis? And as the Pope would seem to suggest, is the United States mostly to blame? It's a nice, easy question. <laughs> I can, maybe I'll get us started and folks can jump in. Uh, I'll answer your questions backwards. The facts speak for themselves that the United States and the Western world is responsible for global greenhouse gas emissions. Like the, the history and the science are irrefutable. It's interesting that the Pope has coordinated this this critique and it's a and it's a strong one and a well deserved one and I was I was pleased and consoled to to see it and also challenged to see it. It's a challenging critique of the way of life that many of us in the West have come to expect and and come to almost demand. Um, I'm so I'm reminded of two things. The first is maybe more theological. Catholics in the United States have been called now like directly to kind of live um, to live in opposition to a con to a consumerist culture. And that's not easy when Amazon Prime ships two days and when credit card companies are invested in fossil fuels and when all of the other things in our world are set up around the consumption of uh, of coal, oil, and natural gas. It's just it's just a fact of the matter. So it's an incredible challenge and also an incredible opportunity. And it's timed well with um, with the way that that things have gone policy wise in the United States in the last couple of years. Nonprofit organizations, including Catholic parishes, now for the first time ever, as five hundred one c three operations have the opportunity to take advantage of the same tax credits for clean energy production and reductions in consumption. That would be like retrofitting a building to be more efficient, other things like that. Those can now be written off nonprofit tax returns or, or they're, they're formed as direct payments to nonprofits rather than write-offs because nonprofits don't have taxes to worry about. Um, but it's that same public money that's available now for every nonprofit organization as well for solar panels and clean energy production and energy efficiency. So in an interesting way, the system might allow for some Catholic organizations to kind of live out this really extreme call from Pope Francis. Um, not extreme, extremely, it, it's an extremely good call. It's just a hard call. Um, and I'm sure that Asa and others can speak more to that as the institutional capacity and yeah, at a university, it's like there are all these factors, but um, but yeah, that's how I've been thinking about it is that it's coordinated well with an opportunity for the church in the United States to to like start undoing some of this in a really tangible way. Yeah, I'll I'll add in. You know, I, I think of Pope Francis's call as um, both like individual, like to me, what am I doing to like shift the contributions to the climate crisis? Um, and so I think that like for me constantly requires a sort of assessment of what, um, you know, how am I living my life in a way that is sustainable or not? Um, I think we'll mention this later, but there's also Catholic Climate Covenant is running a La Date Dam pledge where uh, you can sort of name the particular actions that you'll be taking um, in order to be more sustainable. Um, and it has resources too that we'll send to you so that 
when you say like I'm going to reduce meat consumption, that there's sort of an like a base some resource on how you'll do that, or if you're going to, um, you know, speak to your pastor about talking about cl the climate crisis within the sermons, that there's a guide to that as well. Um, so I think it's you know it's the individual pledge, and then it's also I think an opportunity to move the church to um, the US church to uh, be responsive to climate action, right? So like in your local parish. Um, uh, and then and then lastly, I think there's what Pope Francis like just really highlights in La Date Dam is uh, the role of, um, you know, international governments within this work. So highlighting um, the upcoming COP28 next month um, and just sort of naming that we can do everything we can individually, this group of us, but there has to be legislative action um, in both the, you know, the national scale and then the global scale. When we make these um, declarations of uh, towards climate action, you know, as countries, are, how are we being held accountable to it? Because we haven't for, uh, you know, at least since um, the 2015 Paris Accord. So there also has to be advocacy that we can do individually towards, um, towards our uh, COP and other uh, intergovernmental structures. Yeah, I think I agree with Diana when you were, when I was reading, um... I literally thought of the call within only for yourself, but also to the parish as well. And then it reminded me of how now with the new parish, the parish priest that we have, I have to remind him, you know, about how we did start trying to go green at our parish, our local parish. And so just little things like that, you know, are reminders, you know, because like for me, I live on the Navajo reservation. So it's um things like this doesn't come easily to our parish. And to, you know, just remind people and to let people know um, that this is out there and what we can do individually and, and parish-wide. I think that's, that was my take on it as well. I know right now for um, our diocese, we're still continuing with the uh, restructuring. So um, a lot of the staff are doing surveys of the community. Um, and so we're doing our best to make it known what's important, what we think it's important, including the environment. Um, you know, part of why the farm is no longer because it was felt that it wasn't important to have um, Office of Human Dignity. Um, and we want to make sure that that's not actually what we wanted. We, we need these things. So um, I'm like in awe of like people who can go and lobby and um, go to the government and say, hey, this is what we need. This is what we want. Um, and, you know, that's what we're supposed to do. And now the Pope is saying, so now we have to listen. And um, in your question, like I can help but to feel kind of sad that um, we're saying it's a problem. This group is saying like, you know, all these things that are a problem, but our people that are above us are supposed to be shepherding us don't always feel the same. Um, so we just have to continue to remind them um, in, a, in a compassionate way as well, but just remind them, hey, um, we got we got a planet to take care of, a home to take care of. I have one final question for the group before I hand it back over to Michelle. Some of you may be familiar with Father Daniel Berrigan, the late Jesuit priest who spent several years in prison for protesting the Vietnam War and then later nuclear weapons. And he would often be engaged in conversations with people about very weighty, very difficult topics. And at the end of these conversations, he would ask the same question, which is what gives you hope in the light of the crisis that we face? So I'd like to pose that to everyone here. What gives you hope? I think just evenings like this, you know, sharing our stories and having um, each of us talk about our, you know, what we do and then um, the need for that, I think it gives me hope. And I, 
seeing everybody so passionate. I remember when we did, um, I think it was a couple of years, it was last year in the height of Zoom, the height of COVID, we did a, I did a panel or a webinar with the USCCB on climate, you know, advocacy. And I remember just being so, um, I can't think of the word, but I just felt so um, hopeful, I guess you can say, that there were so many wanting to learn more, because I think when you're out wanting, what can we do more, or what is what else is there to do, I think um, it brings me back to that moment, or it just brings me back to moments like this, or um, anything else like that. I think as long as we're still voicing our, our concern, we have each have a voice and I think that's what gives me hope you know seeing everybody here all the people that decided to log on to zoom anybody that's on the Facebook live I think anyone that's just genuinely interested I think that's what gives me hope because I think if we lose momentum or we lose people not wanting to do this then that's when it gets a little scary you know I think when we were doing the um, curriculum from homemakers you know, there was so many applicants, you know, just to be in the co, you know, to be involved in this. And we had to decide on who was going to be in each subdivision. And so that gave me, you know, it was just so exciting to know that there's just so many young adults across, you know, the USA and even world that um, this is a concern for them, which it should be. I mean, you know, we only have one earth and one chance at this. So to get it right and to start reversing the work that we've, the damage that we've done. Yeah, thanks, Teresa. I, I think what's bringing me hope tonight is actually the energy that, and just maybe the fact that this, not only is it some nice like thing about like you feel, you know, that, it, that it's a way to holiness or a way to kind of like feel better, but gospel nonviolence works. It changes, it changes people, changes minds and people and policy. And, and we're seeing that in the way that young people, like you heard our stories tonight and how we've been changed, but it's a cycle of, of how then all of us and all of you and all of everyone can be changing other people. Um, and it's a, and it's the, it's the same loop of grace that we, that we can read about and pray about, um, in a way of life and the way of working that is intergenerational and that ties the gospel together with our life right now. And this issue of mat of, of incomprehensible scale, this is the only way we can do this. And that's what brings me hope is that it's that we don't, we don't have a choice. We have to be doing this. And the hope comes from the fact that it's a good choice and that it works. I would say, um, I think it brings me hope is the excitement. Um, and you guys said it, I wrote it in my notes, intergenerational, intergenerationally, um, the work that's happening. I think it's something that I always feel that the young people do, but to see that we're all working together, um, it's, it's exciting. Um, so it's something that we all can do together. Uh, my grandmother, she's like, I got a reusable water bottle. I was like, oh my and you know just seeing like even just little things like that that it's it's exciting and um that I can talk to everybody about it that we can work together um you know with just one big community like I'm like okay we, we can do this together and um I'm excited about that um I think what gives me hope is that there's um no action that's too small um really we can start just where we are um, and I've had I've, I've been so blessed being in this work um, and uh, getting to work alongside other young adults who are doing uh, climate um, organizing that they are just starting where they are and they are moving really big things they're creating things they are um, changing people's minds they are broadening the conversation and that's just from you know doing doing just one thing that they were curious about or uh wanted to explore um so I find so much hope that like you don't have to do this huge giant thing you can just do one small thing 
Um, and that that small thing might inspire other people like me, like folks in this group, like it will really just um, resonate across. Thank you everybody tonight for your witness and your work. Michelle? Mm. Oh, my heart feels so full. Thank you all for sharing uh, this evening, like Ryan said, for your for sharing your witness. Um, as I heard all of you share, um, really the thought came to me, your examples, your lives, your work, your relationships, um, and your faith as a sign and symbol of this work. And this, the truly, this work is sacramental. Um, so I just wanna say thank you so much for your sharing this evening. Um, and so we give a big round of applause to all our speakers, Nia, Diana, Henry, Teresa, and our moderator, Ryan. <laughs>